Well, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for uh, having me this morning. I bring my greetings, for, like Pastor Zach said, from the Church Brook Hills. My, my wife and daughter are there worshiping this morning. And um, I'm thankful for this opportunity. Like you said, I've been had the opportunity to meet with him over the last few months, and I've been encouraged uh, to learn about what the Lord is doing here at Valley View. And I pray that he would continue to do that. And I'm glad to be with you this morning as uh, we worship together. <clears throat> and uh, this morning, uh, the, this, the text this morning is actually not going to be Philippians 1. It's going to be Psalm 46. Um, I think I may be preaching in the next couple weeks as well. So I think I'm going to be in Philippians then. But, but today we're going to be in Philippians or Psalm chapter 46. And we're going to be asking the question... Um, Oh, sorry. Anybody hear me? It is. The battery's died on you. Okay. It's muted. Oh, there we go. Can everybody hear me okay? That's better. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Uh, So yeah, we're going to be in Psalm chapter 46. Uh, Psalm 46 this morning. I think I'm able to preach again. I'll be in Philippians chapter 1. Psalm 46, we're going to be looking at the question, uh, where can we go to find refuge? Where can we go to find refuge? And I would like to, as Pastor Zach did this morning, extend um, uh, well wishes to all the mothers here this morning. Uh, Happy Mother's Day. As we talk about where to find refuge, I would say here at the the beginning uh, that the Lord has provided mothers and grandmothers and other mother figures in our lives as places of refuge. I know that's the case in my own life. My, my own mother, grandmother, and even my wife's grandmother has become a source of refuge for me. Um, and even for, for those who, um, this morning, who maybe have lost children um, or maybe do not have children of your own. I know that this day can be particularly difficult uh, for you. But yet, uh, the Lord, uh, you still have tremendous value in, in the Lord and in this church. And um, the simple fact that you are here today... Uh, to, and serve this church as a testimony to the Lord uh, that He is using you to bless the body of Christ. So thank you. And I hope you all have a great Mother's Day. Psalm 46. Psalm 46. I want to thank Brother David for doing the prelude of uh, Mighty Fortresses, Our God. This, that great hymn of the faith was uh, written based off of this psalm. Psalm 46. To the choir master of the sons of Korah, According to Alamoth, a song. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolation on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for this Lord's day and the opportunity to come and, and worship with fellow believers. We pray that you would use the the reading and and teaching of your word to equip and exhort and encourage your flock today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
I've heard it said that it takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. Amen. The Psalms, they were an ancient hymn book of the Jewish people. They were sung all throughout the year for various reasons, uh, different festivals. Some as they were going to worship and some as they were going from worship and some during worship. As Christians, we are familiar with the Psalms, but often we may not know how to apply each of them to our lives. There's a lot of variation, a lot of emotion in, all, in the Psalms. Uh, so how, how do we apply that to our life today? Well, this morning we're going to look at three ways that Psalm 46 uh, encourages us to find refuge in the Lord. But first, let's consider the context of this psalm. Each of the psalms are said a little differently, unlike other books of the Bible where we can walk through and they're in basically the same context. Each of the psalms are, are in a different context. Uh, so let's look at the context. Psalm 46 is the fifth psalm in the second book of the entire collection of the psalms. It's often known as a Zion hymn or a hymn of Zion. Uh, the other hymns of Zion are including Psalm 46 or Psalm 48. Psalm 76, Psalm 87, and Psalm 122. Jerusalem, or the city of God, the city of Zion, it plays a prominent theme in each of these psalms, and we see that in this psalm this morning. Look with me at the beginning of this psalm here. A lot of times we we see the context of a psalm with the little little introduction there at the beginning of each psalm. Many of the psalms are written by who? David. David. This psalm is not. Uh, we see here it says, To the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth, a song. So this one is written by the sons of Korah. So that leads us to ask the question, who are, who were the sons of Korah? If you remember uh, in your, your Old Testament um, that, uh, the son, that Korah, he is a cousin of Moses and Aaron. We see that in Numbers 16. 1 through 50. And that passage records for us the account of Korah's rebellion against Aaron and his authority as high priest of God's people. In that passage in, in Numbers 16, we read that ultimately Korah is killed by the Lord for his rebellion. But yet, in spite of that, some of Korah's descendants become prominent in the service of the temple, mainly leading in worship through music. We see that in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 19. And to me, this is a testimony of God's amazing grace. That even uh, this, this brief introduction reminds us that, um, that God uses, can use the descendants of a rebel to lead his people in worship. Amen. So that shows us this morning that none of us are far from God's grace. So let's begin looking in this, at this psalm as we look at that context there. We see that this psalm is broken up into three stanzas or three verses. <clears throat> we have uh, chapter or, uh, verses 1 to 3, verses 4 to 6, verses 8 to 10. And then you'll notice um, in between verses um, 3 and, uh, excuse me, verse uh, 6 and 8, there is a, another there's a, a, verse 7 is uh, kind of a chorus. And then verse 11 at the end is also that same chorus um, that repeats. Uh, that's very similar to our songs we sing today. We have verses and choruses that repeat. And so it kind of helps rem- help us remember the, the purpose or the theme of that song. Um, in this particular psalm, we see that the, the stanzas or the verses are broken up into two parts. We see that they, uh, the first part is uh, where we go to find solace, where we go to find refuge. And the second part of the verse is um, where we're running from, where we're going from um, the, the turmoil in our, in, in our life. Um, and so that's, that's how these verses are broken up. And then the refrain or that chorus uh, after verses uh, in verse uh, 7 and in verse 11 uh, drive home that main theme of where to find refuge. So let's look this morning at the three ways uh, that we can find refuge. We're going to look at verse, that verse uh, first stanza, verses 1 through 3, that second stanza, verses 4 through 6, and then the third stanza, uh, verses 8 through 10. The first place that we see in this psalm that we go to find refuge is the presence 
of God. The presence of God begins by saying God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. In the midst of difficulty and turmoil and temptation, oftentimes we seek refuge in other things and other places besides God. Yet there is no refuge there at all. In fact, those are just empty substitutes for the true refuge, our God. Psalm 46 exhorts us to seek refuge in God alone and not those other substitutes. For He is alone our true refuge. It says there in verse 1 that the reason we should seek our refuge in God is because He is a very present help in time of trouble. Other translations uh, render that, that, that God is found greatly or that He is an ever-present help. Um, that He is a helper always found. There's a newer translation, uh, the Readable Bible. Um, it was actually, part of it was uh, put together by a gentleman here in Leeds. Um, it says that, it is, that God is an always findable help. The Bible is rich with exhortations that the Lord is our refuge and help. Let's look at a few uh, verses throughout the Bible. So if you're taking notes, you can write these verses down and, and read them later. Second Chronicles 16.9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless towards Him. Psalm 54 verse 4 says, Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. Psalm 27 verse 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 121, 2 and 5, 2 through 5 says, My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. Isaiah 41.10 reminds us to fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Quoting from Psalm 118.6, the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 13.6 says, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And then the words of Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 27 and 28 reminds us, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will not perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And then we cannot forget one of the most encouraging passages in all of the Bible, in particular in the New Testament, regarding our safety and security of the Lord. In Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? For it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So we see here that God is our refuge and strength. He is ever present. He is dependable. He is always with us. And for that reason, we have no reason to fear. Amen. We see in verse two that it begins with the word, therefore. I've always heard that when we encounter this word in the Bible, we must find out what it's there for. Therefore, in the English and other, in other languages, in particular here in the Hebrew, it's a preposition or a connecting word. It, it links what has just been said to what is about to be said. So in this case, verse 1, it links verses 1 through to verses 2 and 3. The word therefore 
It means on the basis of, on account of, or because of. The psalmist begins this song by stating that God is our refuge and strength. That he is always near us. Therefore, on the basis of, on account of, because of, and in light of that truth, that God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help, we will not fear. It doesn't matter what the fear is of. No matter what may be coming our way, we will not fear. No matter what the world throws at us, no matter what comes our way, no matter how small, big, God is our refuge and strength. So because He is our refuge and strength, we will not fear. The result of finding refuge in God is that despite our circumstances, we will not fear. And then the psalmist gives some examples of of what we could be afraid of. He says, Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Using hyperbole here, the psalmist gives external natural disasters as a cause for fear. We were reminded here in Alabama, especially during tornado season, which is almost every month, I think, um, that we have no control over the natural order. We seek refuge in God even when the worst thing imaginable comes to pass. That's what the psalmist is doing here. That though the, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam and the mountains tremble at its swelling. This is, this is unimaginable uh, catastrophe. But even in the midst of that unimaginable catastrophe, we have no reason to fear because God is our refuge and strength. These images serve as metaphors for the storms in our own life. That come our way, even though we have no control over those storms, we will not fear because God is our refuge and strength. You may be here this morning and you're struggling maybe with some family issues, or maybe you've lost a loved one, or maybe uh, you've received a diagnosis recently um, that is devastating. I'm here to remind us this morning through Psalm 46 that God alone is our refuge and strength. No matter what is thrown at us, no matter what comes our way, we can trust that the Lord is our refuge. And he is an ever-present help in that trouble. We see right after verse 3 and then after verse 7 and verse 11 the word Selah. This is a common phrase or a common word in many of the psalms. Not all of them have that word, but in many of the psalms, the word Selah appears, and mostly after different verses, different stanzas. The exact meaning of this particular word and the purpose of this word is not fully known, but it likely refers to a musical interlude uh, similar to um, an instrumental break in our songs today. Most translators leave that word Selah in the text because it does appear in in all of the text in in the original language. Uh, some translations take it and put it at the bottom uh, as a footnote, but but I think that the even though we may not exactly know what that word means, I think it it does remind us today, especially with this um, the, the theme of refuge, because uh, most likely the the word would refer to a pause or, or like I said, a musical interlude. Charles Spurgeon, the the great British Baptist pastor from the 19th century, he makes this observation regarding the Selah. He says, the pause is not an exclamation of dismay. So so the pause in the music is not us giving up on, on the song, but merely it is a rest in the music. We do not suspend our song in alarm but we tune our harps again with deliberation amid the tumult of the storm. It would be well if all of us could say Selah under tempestuous trials, but alas, too often we speak in our haste. We lay our trembling hands bewildered among the strings and we strike the lyre with a rude crash and mar the melody of our life song. So often in our own lives, in the midst of storms, in the midst of trial, in the 
midst of, of things that come our way that we have no control of. We throw our hands up and, and don't know what to do. But the, the Selah in this psalm reminds us to rest, to pause, to be still. It reminds us to rest in the Lord. In difficult seasons, I do this sometimes, read through a, a hymn book. I know we sang a few old hymns this morning. If you don't have a hymn book, I would encourage you, or you can look them up online. Uh, many of those great hymns of the faith remind us to rest in the Lord. We can learn greatly from those who have gone before us through their music, and we can be richly blessed through their songs. I am reminded of one of the, the great hymns, uh, Rock of Ages, where it says, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side, which flows, be of sin the double cure, saved from wrath and make me pure. What a wonderful reminder of the hope we have in Christ. That even in the midst of trial, in the midst of temptation, in the midst of turmoil in our life, Christ has endured the cross and we can find refuge in him. But next, not only do we see we find refuge in the presence of God, we find refuge, number two, in the people of God, the people of God. Verse four through seven says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the most high. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. So we see here that we find refuge in the people of God, in the city of God. For the people of ancient Israel, the city of God, Jerusalem, also called a city on a hill, was where the temple resided. And it was the center of Jewish worship. Jews returned there many times throughout the year uh, for various feasts and festivals. It was, it was the center of their life. But for us, we, we find refuge not in, in a center, city center like Jerusalem, but in, in the local church and the people of God here amongst his people here at Valley View. We see here, I find it interesting, it says um, in verse 4, speaking of the city of God, it says that there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. A holy habitation of the Most High. This psalm, being a Zion hymn, speaks of the city of Jerusalem. But geography tells us that the city of Jerusalem does not have a major river running through it. This language harkens back to Eden. And it looks forward to the new Jerusalem that has the river of life running through it. We we're also reminded that the fact of the fact that Jesus referred to himself as living water. So as we find our refuge in the, in the people of God, we're, we're still ultimately finding our rest in God, in the presence of God, because he is among his people. We see that here in, in verse five. It says that God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. Some translations translate this uh, right there where it says um, God is in the midst of her. Um, it says just above in verse four where it says that uh, the city of God is the holy habitation of the most high. Some, some translations, particularly the King James and the New King James, translate that, that as the, not the holy habitation of the most high, but as the tabernacle of the most high. This language is reminiscent of the Israelites coming out of Egypt. When they would camp, marching from Egypt to the promised land, they would set up the tabernacle first, the place of worship first. And then the 12 tribes would encamp around it. So in a very literal sense, it would remind them that God was in the midst of his people. The same is true for us, that where we are gathered, he is with us and he is in the midst of us. He he indwells us with the power of the Holy Spirit. But then he fills uh, his people, the church, with the, the power of the Holy Spirit and that we can find refuge among his people because he is here with us as well. The verse six reminds us, it says that the nations rage, 
The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. In contrast here to the safety and solace of the city of God among the people of God, the world around us is a volatile place. Outside of the city of God, outside of the people of God, we are not safe. Too often, sometimes we too can be caught up in the rage of the nations. But as the people of God, we must not put our hope in any earthly kingdom. We must put our hope in Christ alone. Psalm 2 has, kind of has the other side of this psalm. Psalm 2 talks about the nations raging and the kingdoms plotting in vain to overthrow God and his king, ultimately pointing to Christ. Uh, the, the people want to overthrow the rule of God. Uh, psalm 2 is a rebuke to the nations who rage against the Lord. But Psalm 46 is written to us, to the people of God, to find refuge in God alone. And then we see in verse 7, that repeating refrain, that repeating chorus that's repeated also in verse 11, that the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. That word, the Lord of hosts, in the original language, in the original Hebrew, is, uh, means the, the Yahweh or the Lord of armies. Yahweh of armies. As the nations rage, we have no reason to fear because God fights for us. We're reminded of this in Exodus 14 and Exodus 15, where it says God fights for, uh, for us, that God fought for the people of Israel. I'm reminded of the story in Exodus, maybe in Numbers, Zach, maybe give me a reference there, but um, where the, the people of Israel are fighting a, a battle and Moses is sitting up on the mountain and as long as he keeps his arms up, uh, the people of Israel prevail, but then he gets tired and has to put his hands down. Uh, the people begin to lose the battle. But that the two, you know, Aaron and Hur on the other side, put, hold his arms up and keep his arms steady so that the people of Israel can prevail. That, that was a reminder to the people of Israel that it was God that was fighting for them. We think of the Battle of Jericho where you know, they, they fought that battle with trumpets where they marched around it seven times and blew the trumpets and then the walls fell. But then the very next city that the people of Israel tried to conquer, they did it their own way and they were defeated. We were reminded here in this psalm that God is with us, that he fights our battles. And we're reminded in, in Ephesians 6 verse 12 that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and um, spirits of the, in the spirit realm, that we do not fight against flesh and blood. But next, in this, next, uh, this last stanza, verses 8 through 10, we not only find refuge in the presence of God and in the people of God, but in the works of God, in the works of God. Verse 8 through 10, it says, Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has brought desolations on the earth, He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Here the psalmist invites us to see the works of the Lord. He is our refuge because he alone has the power to stop the calamity that engulfs us. We're reminded here of Jesus calming the storm in the Gospels, Mark 4, uh, 35 through 41. That God alone can calm the storm and he alone can stop the rage of the nations. Verse 10 is one of probably one of the most famous verses in in all the Psalms. It says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The psalmist ends This last verse, this last stanza of the psalm, allowing God to have the last word. This verse, if you'll notice in our English translations, it has quotes around it. That's because God is is directly quoted here in this verse. So often this verse can be misinterpreted and misapplied 
that we think that it is for us to find tranquility in the presence of God, which I think there's a portion of that that can be applied there. But, but directly in this psalm, after verse, uh, you know, stanza two and then the works of the Lord, he, he fights our battles for us. It really is not directed at us. But this is directed at the calamity. It's directed at the storm. It's directed at the rage of the nations. It is, it is not a call for us to find tranquility in the presence of God as much as it is a command from the Lord to the nations, to the storms, to be still, to cease, and to stop. That He alone is worthy of worship. That He alone will be exalted. But the psalm ends with the same refrain, driving home that point that God is our refuge and strength. And um, He is our solace amidst the chaos. That the Lord of hosts is with us. He fights for us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. As we think about these three ways... That we can find refuge today. Our eyes must be affixed on the greatest work of God. Not only stopping battles, stopping storms, providing miracles in our lives, which those are, are great. But the most important work, the greatest work of God is the cross. We were singing about that just this morning. For it is only through the cross that we can find refuge. On the cross, Jesus Jesus absorbed for us the most terrible thing that we could be subjected to. The wrath of God. And as Jesus died in our place, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Allowing us to come into His presence to seek refuge in Him. Through the cross, we can now boldly approach the throne. Into his presence. We see that in Hebrews 4 16. As we study his word and spend time in prayer, we seek solace from all the troubles of our life. In verse, uh, excuse me, through the cross, we, we gather for worship. And we worship the Lord not in the temple, but among his people, the local church. Jesus called the local church a city on a hill. The church is a place that we can seek refuge through the word, through prayer, and by bearing one another's burdens. Through the cross, we can trust that one day all will be set right. One day, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. Psalm 46 reminds us of the words of Jesus Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Find refuge in Jesus. As we close this morning, you may be here and you've never placed your faith in Jesus. Today, he is calling you to trust in him. His death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead in your place. It is only through Jesus that we can find true refuge and true strength and true rest. You may be here this morning and you're in the midst of turmoil. Maybe in the midst of temptation. Maybe in the midst of a difficult season of your life. Look to Jesus and find rest. You may be here this morning and you're in a good season of life at the moment. This psalm reminds us to keep our eyes on the Lord. In all seasons, we are to be ready for the difficulty to come. As we sing, I encourage you to take the time to stop and consider how the Lord is speaking to you. And uh, that you respond as you feel appropriate. You can find Pastor Zach or myself. We'd be glad to to chat with you after this service. um, And and encourage you uh, today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Psalm 46.